Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. So a while back, you might remember I was soliciting for people to come on the show and using their first-person experiences as a template, try to tell the story of how the web happened in various countries. Well, podcast listener Thomas Ganter took me up on the offer, and today you're going to hear the story of how personal computing and the web came to Germany. Many thanks to Thomas for being willing to come on and share his story and the story of his country. And if anyone else wants to do the same and to explain, I don't know, uh, how the web came to India or Iran or something like that, please get in touch. I'd like to do another one of these uh, later in the year. In the meantime, please enjoy Thomas Ganter. Thomas Ganter, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for representing an entire country here today. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we do have to set the context. So the, the sort of rude question of uh, what year you were born? Um, uh, 1972. Okay, so uh, you were definitely a kid before computers were common in the household. So then let's uh, let's start with that favorite question of mine, which is um, the first, actually in your case, the first computer you encountered, because I bet you encountered them before you had one in your home. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, computers, uh, as you can imagine, were um, nothing that people had at home when I was a kid. So uh, I was about 10 or 11, I was in fifth grade when I encountered my first computer that I can actually touch. Yeah. So I, um, I I just moved to this new school and I found that uh, I had a computer room. Um, great. And uh, it was or, um, even permissible for uh, students to go there, <laughs> even greater. Um, and uh I, I uh, recall scaring um, the hell out of my uh, parents because I decided to uh, actually spend as much time there as possible, which meant I spent the first night there. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, they uh, there were six or seven uh, CBM 4032s and uh, 8096s there. So this is, um, uh, I, I guess they were called PET um, mm -hmm. in Yes. Yeah, right. All in one boxes. Yeah, so <laughs> um, ancient uh, um, uh, pre uh, um, uh, predecessors of the iMac, I guess. Um, green screen uh, monitor and keyboard all in one type thingies with um, cassette drives attached to store programs. Right, no hard drives, uh, floppy drives, and things like that to to load up the systems. But but they were individual terminals. You're these aren't uh, you're not sharing. You can have your own computer and sit down directly in front of it. Yeah, there was a, there was a, a small elite group of um, uh, students at the school that uh, understood about computers or that knew that the room was there, and uh, we started well camping in the room in every three minute. So uh, what what sort of, are you mostly playing games or using educational software? What are you, what are you doing with these things in, in school? Um, well, in, the, in the early 80s, um, yes. this was, uh, there was no such thing like a market for educational software, at least not that I was aware of. Yeah. So we are, uh, we switched on those things and they said in the nice friendly green letters ready yeah? and there was a blinking cursor um, and then we started to explore how those things worked and uh, we uh, started teaching ourselves 
basic and uh, um, once the basic was not sufficient anymore we uh, started exploring um, uh, machine language so um, we uh, coded our first um, assembler and uh, started uh, fool, um, yeah, fooling around in uh, 6502 um, assembler language. Actually, that's a that's an important distinction to make. I, I actually am young enough that by the time uh, we had computers in our schools, as you say, there was educational software. There were even games, you know, the famous Oregon Trail that, that every one of my age in the States uh, points to as the game that everyone played on their Apple IIEs. But um, when computers first hit the scene, there's not prepackaged software for them. So if you get interested in computers, the only thing you basically can do with them is learn how to program them and, and write your own games yep. and apps and things like that. I, I don't know about the Oregon Trail, and, but <laughs> maybe after we stop recording, you can tell me what the Oregon Trail oh, is. Oh, believe me, oh. Uh, anyone, anyone uh, 40 years old and older in the United States knows what Oregon Trail is. But anyway, go on, go on. Um, well, when we were fooling around, yeah, so like a, a lot of print statements and and input statements in BASIC, or um, um, actually, what what we coded were uh, were games, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we we tried to outsmart each other in uh, programming games, mm -hmm. and then around the same time, um, uh, war games, I um, hit the movies, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> And uh, so all of us were trying to program interactive games like want to play a game and global um, thermonuclear war and stuff. <laughs> and uh, I guess at that point in time, the most famous password was Joshua. <laughs> uh, and uh, we tried to implement a tic-tac-toe. Um, then uh, also around the same point in time, um, there was an hilariously long um, a basic game that someone came up with um, or probably typed from a magazine which was a Star Trek game and I understand this was ported to a lot of platforms mm -hmm. so probably it also existed on the on the Apple IIs where you basically had a, a 8 by 8 grid of, of quadrants and you were uh, the captain of uh, Star um, of, of um, Enterprise. Uh, Enterprise, and uh, you were about hunting Klingons. Um, and the story about this game was it took about 10 minutes to load from uh, a cassette tape, and our um, the main break um, in uh, in the school was 20 minutes. So uh, we got we got the key to the computer room. We went there. We loaded the game, and then there was like eight minutes of playing because then we need to return the key and uh, be in class when the break was over. Wow, that's a shame. You should have convinced somebody, to, a teacher, to preload them for you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so so this was this was um, real computers. Yeah. So. Um... Are, is there any networking going on with these computers at school? Is this where um, Bildschirm text comes in? <laughs> no, there was no networking. There was okay. one printer and it was a, attached to one of the computers. But um, Bildschirm text. Yes. Um, uh, or BTX, which uh, as it was abbreviated, was an online service. Um, uh, very much like uh, probably AOL or uh, CompuServe or... Uh, any other type of um, walled garden uh, online service that um, also started in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 1983, Bildschirm apparently. Bildschirm text was uh, what it was uh, called in Germany, um, but there were compatible systems in a lot of countries um, based on uh, Prestel, which is a... Um, the British... Uh... Uh, version think, of, yeah think it's it's a very chunky blocky type of uh, graphics um and it very much looked like um what you also have on tv when you switch on the text mode of some channels and you see additional information mm -hmm. um, um at least i hope you also do this in the us because uh, this is what 
we have. Yeah? No, um, we never had that. At, like, it, I because I know it, even as late as the early two thousands, uh, they still had that in Britain, and maybe you still do have it on on regular TVs. But no, we never had that that uh, video tech stuff. Um, oh. Because yeah. right, Minitel was based on a similar technology. Um, yep. The Brits had it uh, based out of the British Post Office GPO, and so I guess this is uh, the the same sort of stuff. But uh, you guys had it for Germany. Yep, this was uh, basically run by the German Post, um, which mm -hmm. was um, a ministry then. So it was a state. Um, it was the, the the Ministry for Post and Telecommunications, Bundespost. Um, and uh, they uh, introduced this as a means of getting uh, people online, yeah. And it was um, intended to be um, um, for serious use. Yeah? That you could do the banking stuff. You could um, um, uh, get flight information or train information. Uh, and it was run through a set-top box, which was connected to the TV. Uh, which uh, probably was why most people confused it with uh, the uh, um, one-way only, information only, um, uh, video text thingy that uh, ran along the, um, uh, the the TV programs themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah? But this was separate, even though it looked the same. Um, it was not attached to a channel, but you uh, had a, a modem set-top box combo thingy which you connected to the phone line. Um, this one dialed into the network. Um, and then uh, you had horribly slow um, connections to um, the, the, the one central hub, um, which then provided uh, chunky graphics. Um, so I'm, and I'm, I'm curious, though. Um if you can remember at the time, did you think of that as something else or did you think of that as computing? You know what I mean? Like I would, we would say yeah. now, Oh, that's early networked computing. But did you think of, Oh, well the stuff that I do at school is computing and this stuff on the TV, that's something else. Oh, it, it was, um, well, it was outlandish. Yeah. It was, uh, something very special. Um, but it was not, I didn't consider this computing because, uh, you couldn't do stuff yourself. Yeah, this was. Uh, there were services you need to. Know, you needed to know uh, the, the numbers to dial. Yeah, so uh, um, not dial in the sense of dial the phone line, but the the menu system. Um, uh, <laughs> there, there was no mouse or anything. Yeah, there was a menu system, and you needed to know the number of the service that you wanted to use inside this walled garden um, uh, block graphics uh, environment. Uh, so there was like a, a main menu and you needed to know that the uh, um, 1188 was like uh, the uh, the online phone book. Yeah, and you mm -hmm. could do a phone number lookup. And uh, whatever, 4711 was um, um, uh, your local bank or, or something like this. Yeah, so it was... Um, an access system to a different type of services. And this was uh, extremely interesting. And uh, this was uh, very much timeshare. I, I, I never knew anyone who had one at home. But uh, as I mentioned, there was the post office and you could go there and they had one or two booths uh, in which you could access those machines and you had to pay on a pay-per-use basis, like for the time you used it. So did you, I want, I want to get into if there were things like BBSs and stuff like that, but um, to bring you back into this story, I think you get a, a computer in your house in around like 87, right? Yep. And I, you, I bought... you, you get a modem around the same time too. Yeah, uh, shortly thereafter. Yeah, I, I bought myself a uh, Commodore Amiga, um, which were... Uh extremely popular in Europe. I am um, not entirely sure on how popular they were in the US. Not but, as popular uh, as the 64s, but a lot, a lot of people had Amigas too, yeah. Uh, but basically, if, if you owned a computer um, around that time, you either owned a, a Commodore Amiga or you owned an Atari ST. So those were the two cool computers. I got myself a, a Commodore Amiga and... Uh, um, uh, shortly thereafter, I guess it was 88, um, 
I uh, got my first modem. Yeah, and uh, I was beyond uh, um, what we called an acoustic coupler, which uh, basically you you attached to the, uh, the 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 earpiece of the physical phone. This uh, was a dedicated box to plug into the phone lines. Um, hilariously slow. I, I, I guess my first modem was a 14k um, modem. Um, uh, and, uh, I know that the last modem that I had was a 56 K modem. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I dialed into uh, bulletin board systems. So, uh, mostly, uh, posting to message boards and, uh, downloading, um, software like shareware, um, freeware, uh, yeah, on, on, the, on the Amiga, it, it, this was mostly the, uh, um, infamous um, uh, Fred Fish um, public domain collection. The, the we can assume that these BBSs were being hosted on you know somebody's computer somewhere you know a few yeah. miles away or something. <laughs> Maybe even uh... next door. <laughs> No, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I never knew anyone uh, that, uh, at least not in my in my uh, small rural town, um, that uh, operated a BBS. So yeah, they were uh, in remote distances. So it was always like uh, um, uh, long distance calls, yeah? and uh, different to what I understand uh, the the US phone system is. There is there was never a thing like. Uh, um, uh, free local calls or anything. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a local call was um, uh, 23 uh, Fennec, which was the uh, basically the cent equivalent um, per uh, eight minutes. Yeah. Um, so so to be connected for an hour, this was already um, several uh, German marks, um, and uh, it uh, very quickly became very expensive, and um, um, uh, medium or long distance calls um, were also 23 uh, cents fanning, but uh, the, the time slice was significantly shorter, like uh, per two minutes or per minute or per half minute. Yeah? Um, and uh, I, I dialed into a BBS, which was in Rosenheim. This is 20 kilometers. So this was uh, barely not um, local call, yeah, so it was a medium range call. Mm -hmm. um, so w we went online uh, or into the system. We uh, um, downloaded uh, our messages. Uh, we uh, probably posted something or uh, started some downloads and uh, tried to unhook the line as quickly as possible. Yeah. Also, during the time that I was using the modem. Um, my brothers and parents couldn't use the phone. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, you go to university early 90s, like 91-ish or so. Um, is that when you get your first taste of, of the real internet in, in air quotes, I guess? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, at uh, the end of 91, I uh, joined university in Munich, and uh, yeah, uh, within the first week, I got my uh, my uh, my own access for the server room of the uh, mathematics department. Um, I, I I started uh, mathematics um, in Munich, and uh, ooh, this was a, a a room, and there were about a dozen um, uh, SunSpark stations. And uh, those were connected to the network. And the network, as I found out, was the internet. At that point in time, I um, even didn't think in terms of like, this is the internet. Mm -hmm. It was just networked computers, which was a great thing. And uh, then uh, like, um, like 10 years earlier, when we taught each other the cool stuff to do on the uh, CBM machines, um, so the more experienced, the grown-up students um, taught us the stuff that we could do with those uh, great uh, new machines there, yeah, like uh, um, finger people, 
And I, I found it hilarious that you could finger someone on the network. Um, and uh, then uh, I learned about F about FTP and I learned about, uh, well, domain names. And it, it um, uh, quickly became apparent that this is not like a local thingy, um, but this is like a global thingy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, the uh, boom, yeah, we were uh, transported into a completely new universe and because the, it, the, you it, could you could finger into whitehouse.gov. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in '91, is that is that unusual, or is it assumed that that's a tool? This these networked computers, that's a tool that uh, was common at university at the time. Um, or was it a new and up and coming thing, maybe? Uh, I only went to one university, so uh, my uh, my basis for comparison is limited. Mm -hmm. But um, um, the uh, Department for uh, Computer Science, they had a, a big like like a warehouse um, filled with machines. Um, the uh, the CS guys had um, uh, HP um, uh, workstations, so the uh, the mathematics guys like us, we had sons, and sons were considered better than the HPs. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very common for the uh, for departments to have um, uh, networked computers and to uh, um, to provide access also to the students. Um, but uh, outside the university world, um, uh, networks or uh, the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, was like non-present. Yeah. Yeah. I could I could dial uh, into the uh, data center from home, um, which was um, a big endeavor. Yeah. It, it was. Um, I, I recall that um, if if my my memory doesn't play tricks, the uh, connection to uh, the data center was using a um, uh, 3270 terminal emulation. So uh, to do this on my Amiga at home um, required literally jumping through hoops, but uh, I could get online and I could check my, uh, um, my email, my university email, and my parents couldn't understand what I was talking about, <laughs> that I had email and I could communicate with everybody on the planet using email because um, they didn't know anyone on the planet that had an email address other than me. So it was completely non-relevant to my parents. Yeah? Do you remember uh, encountering the web for the first time? This is probably a few years later, but maybe yeah. when you're still at, at university. I definitely was still at university when this uh, cool new product uh, um, um, program popped up, which was called Mosaic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember this because uh, I also was still at university when I uh, encountered Amazon and uh, I ordered my first book online. Wow. Um, and uh, at, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, so, so I was an Amazon customer when Amazon still used uh, uh, an, an A with, uh, which looked like very much like an, an, uh, an, an Amazon River running through mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. was its logo. Um, and this was insane. Yeah, I just did it because I could do it. My, <laughs> my, my, my parents owned a bookseller. So, so this was, and, and I, I guess this was when, when it dawned to them that um, this is actually something new because I got a book from the other end of the, uh, of the planet, um, shipped to our door and I paid hilarious fees. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I got access to a, to a range of products which they couldn't get. Yeah. I mean, for a, for the German booksellers to get a, uh, um, and, and I, I, I think it was uh, the tech book by, by Donald Knuth that I ordered, uh, something like, it was an Edison Wesley title. Um, this was simply not possible. Yeah, They had a, a, a big book. It was uh, like 
10, 10, 10 centimeters, which is uh, four, four inches thick book of all the titles that I could order. This is basically all the back catalog that was available to them. Mm-hmm. And this book was not in there, yeah? <laughs> because it was from a different country, yeah? Different language, mm-hmm. um, completely new, yeah? And um, that uh, this, I, I, I thought it was great. Yeah? And uh, um, I'm still, it did not dawn to me that this is uh, basically making this great internet thingy accessible to everybody, which ultimately it would, yeah? Um, Mosaic just was like the next evolution from Gopher, which was the text-based version mm-hmm. of, uh, or at least the text-based equivalent of what now is the World Wide Web. No? Well, so this is what I'm super curious about. Um, is so th- this is your you're a little bit ahead of the game because you're the right age. You're at university. Um, I I go to university in '96, so I have a really clear memory of this that that's around the year that oh all of a sudden my mom is starting to have an email address and normal people are starting to go online so i'm curious if you could you know obviously you're not an expert but what's what's your memory of um the web or the internet in general going mainstream when when you know, your parents or your friends would start to get email addresses, that sort of thing. How does it happen? Are there ISPs? Tell me that story. Okay. Um, this is, um, um, again, getting back to, uh, getting, getting around to um, telephone network work differently mm-hmm. in Germany than uh, probably what what you know of from the U.S. It was uh, no free local calls. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, ISPs popped up uh, around ninety six, ninety seven, yeah? um, and uh, all of these were like small companies, um, um, small uh, software companies, small. Uh, um, entrepreneurs that uh, recognize that this is a new, interesting thing. Um, in '96, uh, in parallel to my studies, I started working um, at, a, at a at a local company. We uh, we were a hardware manufacturer, and uh, our internet connection. Everybody there had an uh, an email address. Uh, so this was my second email address that I got. Mm-hmm. Um, because we, we also had a branch uh, somewhere in the U.S. and we were we needed to communicate with our colleagues. Yeah, um, our internet connection was a dial-up line. Yeah, so so we were an IT company. We we we, we created hardware, and uh, we had a, a, a dual ISDN uh, dial-up connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, so so we basically popped. Um, our email accounts, we run our own mail server and everything. Yeah, so this was my second um, email address, and um, and uh, then to to uh, um, uh, get back to your question, yeah, um, I wanted to also have the internet at home. So I, I looked around and I found I, uh, I um, an ISP um, in in Wasserburg, yeah, which also a uh, smallish type of uh, city. Um, 25 uh, kilometers away, um, and I could dial in there. Yeah, so they provided a dialing line other than the BBS that I was used to. This now used uh, TCP/IP, and I I got myself online. Yeah, and I paid double. I paid for the phone fees, and I paid for the online time. So there wait, no, let's be no clear. Phone. So you're you're still paying by the hour. So you're paying you're paying the phone company's hourly fees. And then you pay this ISP's hourly fees on top of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so getting online was hilariously expensive. Yeah. And uh, everyone who was uh, in a city um, had an advantage because uh, local fees were cheaper than long distance fees. Um, m- my town has ten thousand people. Yeah. So we were small. There was no local ISP. Um, I had to go through. Um, uh, regional calls um, like everybody had to do 
um, in those times. Yeah? Um, but very quickly, um, the uh, Bundespost, yeah, G German Post, mm -hmm. um, converted the uh, Bildschirm Text Service, the Vault Garden Set Top Box TV experience, to a uh, internet service. And uh, obviously, because they were the post office, they were present everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, boom, yeah, there was like local dial-in um, available in every local uh, local area net. And what year, uh, what year would that be about? Um, uh, I would guess also around uh, 96, 97, 98. Okay. okay. So. Uh, um, this was more or less in parallel to all those local ISPs popping up. Yeah? Um, by that point in time, Bundespost um, also has been converted. Um, uh, I guess the term is they IPO'd. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, was, it, it was privatized. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, the idea was to uh, convert Germany into a country of stock owners, mm -hmm. which didn't work out. <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, with a lot of um, marketing, they tried to push everybody into purchasing uh, stocks of the uh, the uh, two companies that they privatized out of the postal system, which was the post system, um, which uh, today is DHL, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is uh, uh, one of the biggest global uh, logistics companies, right. but this to be a German post. Yeah. And uh, and Deutsche Telekom, mm -hmm. which uh, used to be the phone part of the uh, of the postal system, and also Deutsche Telekom, uh, with uh, T-Mobile is now a global presence. Um, and, and it's Deutsche Telekom that that converts BTX into this online thing. Yeah, and uh, because li like with with Apple and everything was I for uh, for a time, now with Deutsche Telekom everything was T. Yeah, so it was T online. Um, very much like America Online or CompuServe, this was like T Online. Um, this was the rebranded version of BTX, and um, th th they still had uh, the the the, the set-top boxes and they gateway into uh, the internet. But uh, they also, for the people that didn't want to have the set-top box on the TV experience, um, they very quickly provided modem dial-in options, yeah? and. Uh, I would I would guess half of uh, the German population do have a T online um, email address somewhere. Mm. Is is AOL um, competing at this time? Because I know that they had a big um, push into Europe. I don't know how successful. Actually, I really don't know that. I should look into that. How successful they were in trying to move into Europe. Well, uh, th there was a time in which AOL um, flooded. Um, uh, Germany with uh, free CD-ROMs with like 300 minute type of offers. Huh? Um, and I understand it was more or less the same in the US. Uh, at, at some point in time you could you could uh, live on the internet by means of uh, hundreds of free DVDs, uh, uh, um, CD-ROMs. Right, or, just or... set up a new account, new account, new account, right. <laughs> um, but uh, they still needed to bridge the gap of um, the fee for the for the online time itself, yeah? because uh, at that point in time, still you had to pay by the minute. Even today, um, uh, with uh, some uh, phone accesses, you need to pay by the minute. Um, even though um, with most packages, you now get uh, flat rates for. Uh, um, basically all landline calls uh, within Germany um, simply because privatizing the sector also brought prices down. Um, AOL, I don't think is any meaningful presence today anymore. Um, I uh, seem to recall that there were um, uh, the, the German operation of AOL was um, purchased by some uh, um, local regional phone company um and they uh, vanished out of public presence i cannot recall seeing aol in 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 the face of the public anywhere 
So when do when do uh, faster than dial up speeds and like sort of the the service providers uh, in the modern sense that we would know about like DSL and, and things like that does that come around like turn of the century? Yep. So the the state of the art connection internet connection um, to to have as a private citizen would have been ISDN, which was a, a digital. Um, um, multi-line service on the on the copper line um, and then um, the big new thing was going from the 128k to 2 megabit mm -hmm. which was uh, DSL the first DSL offerings were 2 megabit lines and this was fast blazing fast um, and then they upgraded to uh, 6 megabits and 25 megabits um, and uh, this was this was rolled out rather quickly in uh, big parts of the country, um, and this is um, I, I guess this would be 125 different shows now. Um, after reunification, mm -hmm. um, there was a big push to uh, modernize the infrastructure, especially in the eastern part of Germany, mm -hmm. where I'm not. Um, where uh, internet was uh, non-existent or, or any type of, 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 of network or global communication was non-existent um, until the downfall of the communist reign. Um, and uh, there was a big push to push fiber into the ground. So uh, um, there were big regions where um, they uh, modernized the infrastructure by putting fiber um, um, uh, as as a basis for transmission, <laughs> and now uh, even though they had a modern infrastructure, they were basically not getting a DSL because DSL is a copper um, technology. Right, right. Um, <laughs> uh, now now they are happy because uh, currently we are uh, in 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 the big push for fiber to the home. Yeah. Now in the western part. Where there was all this copper infrastructure, um, the, uh, the, the we moved from two to six to uh, twenty-five. Um, uh, currently, fifty in in the cities you get a hundred or uh, sometimes even two hundred megabits mm -hmm. um, copper line. And the only um, um, other access technology that uh, any has any meaningful presence currently, other than DSL um, and fiber is cable. Um, and uh, also cable has a different um, meaning than in the USS, uh, in USA. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I understand that CNN is supposed to be the cable news network. Yes, that's right. C cable. Cable is also something that uh, did not have universal adoption. Right. Also, also TV cable was something that was put into the ground by the post office. Yeah. So right. Right. Bundespost only also owned this infrastructure, and in the wake of uh, privatizing, uh, they had to sell off the cable uh, networks, the cable infrastructures to some a, a lot of regional uh, providers. Um, and uh, around the turn of the century, um, in parallel to uh, the uh, to the, the rollout of DSL, they also um, the, the cable operators also started rolling out um, internet access or uh, basically triple play um, access on the, uh, on the on the on the cable infrastructure. And for a time. Um, I had uh, my uh, my my ISP service through my cable operator. Uh, we didn't own a TV. <laughs> um, you skip that well, step. Just go directly to the internet. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, we never felt it necessary. Yeah, and uh, it probably also was uh, some form of uh, protection for the kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but uh, to this date we don't have a, a TV, but we are a little bit cheating because we do have a uh, a beamer at home, and uh, um, we 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 can uh, basically have um, 
small dosage of uh, Netflix and uh, um, um, TV serials for uh, for for the kids. Yeah. Or currently there is the the Olympics going on, right. so uh, um, we we stream those. Yeah. At that point in at, at that point in time we are talking about the turn of the century. Obviously, streaming was not a thing. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, also we we didn't need a TV. Um, but we needed the cable connection to have a phone and internet um, um, and radio. <laughs> they also transmitted radio on the phone uh, on, on on the TV cable, um, and uh, this was 25 megabits, and I was uh, hilariously happy because I felt like I, I was I was uh, um, a king of our small city because I, I I was sure I had the fastest internet connection. Um, today, today we have 50 megabit, and I, sometimes it feels slow. Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm eagerly awaiting the upgrade to 100. Well, so uh, to sum up the 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 state of the market or the state of uh, the environment is now, it's it's dominated by the telecom companies generally, like Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom, and that sort of thing. Like that's how everyone gets their internet these days. Yep, there was there was a small. Um, time period like 10 uh, 15 years in which wholesale was a big thing and uh, um, there was then there was a, a, a huge consolidation now the the biggest um, wholesaler um, or, or reseller what, whatever it's it's called um, for internet services uh, is a company called uh, United internet um, which uh, is into hosting, but also um, um, resells uh, the, the Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom and Telefonica phone lines. Um, but other than uh, one or two big um, ISP companies that uh, survived the, the big consolidation, um, the main um, players are Vodafone, uh, Telefonica and Deutsche Telekom. All three um, are also the only three remaining um, um, original mobile phone operators in uh, Germany. Uh, so uh, every every SIM card you have in a German phone is uh, in the end by one of those three companies. And uh, also in the mobile phone market and the mobile internet, there is some uh, some resellers, but uh, those are the only three remaining networks. And the same is true for uh, the, uh, the the fixed net accesses to the internet, um, plus um, the cable companies. But um, Vodafone owns um, a big chunk of the cable networks, and there are one or two um, independent um, cable providers remaining. Plus, um, and this is funny, plus some cities do have their own um uh, ISPs Minnesota, yeah. yeah so so the 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 the, the uh, capital of Bavaria the the German state I'm I'm living in uh, Munich which you probably know for the Oktoberfest and uh, a lot of beer and and stuff well, uh, I I know from Bayern Munich but yes <laughs> okay the, the the same Munich yeah yes yeah, um, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 municipal um, utility company um, they also have their own ISP, Mnet. And because they have access to every home, because they also do the plumbing and the heating uh, and everything, so they also have uh, fiber cables in there. And they provide 200 megabit uh, internet access for everybody inside the uh, the, the city limits um, if you choose to uh, to use them. Yeah, So they have phone, internet, and everything um, by, the, uh, by the local utility. Yeah? But again, in 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 the in the in the rural parts of Germany, and most of Germany is rural parts, um, you are left with uh, the three big players. When uh, to to end up here um, again, just in your opinion, I'm not asking you to speak for everyone, but um, the mainstreaming of the web and, and internet stuff in Germany. Uh, is it rapid? Do you feel like Germany is sometimes behind? And as an example, I'd use things like 
adoption of Facebook by uh, normal people, adoption of Netflix, use of Netflix, that sort of thing. When a new technology comes on the scene, is German Germany usually ahead of the game, a little behind the game? What do you think? <laughs> um, so uh, you you probably are aware that currently we are we Germany is still waiting. Um, I guess we are in, in month five since the uh, last general election, uh -huh. and we still don't have a new government yet. Yeah, so the parties are still negotiating. In the current um, uh, um, coalition paper that's uh, agreed, um, one of the goals, the, uh, the the tentative next governance that's forced is that there would be a free Wi-Fi in every public transport mm. uh, 2050. So this is for the state of internet in Germany. <laughs> um, the adoption rate for, for stuff like Facebook um, is huge. Yeah? You, you, you are basically um, no one if you don't uh, WhatsApp and, uh, and, and, and have mm -hmm. a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which is funny, yeah. So, so texting for a lot of people is synonymous with uh, sending WhatsApp messages. And if you're not on the WhatsApp um, network, right. um, you you're like um, an outsider. Um, and <laughs> I have big debates with my daughter about uh, using um, WhatsApp or Facebook because I um, I don't permit it. Yeah, I consider Facebook evil, um, but but I allow her to be. Um, to to have a, a Google account because uh, well there the, 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 you have to give in to at least one of those evils yeah um, <laughs> pick but, your poison uh, yeah yeah the the, the uh, but then w one is enough yeah um, and the the public education and the awareness of what all of this means is like non-existent yeah the uh, the uh, Awareness of also of privacy is um, non-existent, uh, or uh, at least significantly reduced. Yeah, um, and still everybody is very, very scared about uh, all this new stuff. Yeah, so um, and and this is this is uh, this is curious. Yeah, it's like a paradox. Um, online banking. Um, a, a, a lot of people do a bank transaction online um, and still um, at the same point in time um, everybody is scared of these new technologies huh? so hmm. um, I don't know I, I, I think that uh, a certain age group probably people that are younger than us adopt everything um, extremely quickly. There, there are one global community, and uh, our age group or older, yeah, are probably resistant to adopt. Germany as a nation is uh, because of our um, federal structure. Um, there is the intention to further the uh, the, the 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 usage of the internet. Or the uh, the digitalization of the uh, the the, uh, the the country. Yeah, um, we want to become um, on the leading edge. Um, at the same point in time, uh, the investments are not there to actually push this. Yeah, um, the uh, the the rollout of uh, fast internet, and they still consider 25 megabits fast internet. Um, I I I I, um, I listened to another podcast, a German one, this morning, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the statement on this uh, podcast was: um, fast internet in today's time is not measured in megabits. Yeah, the the unit of measure for fast internet would be uh, gigabits or beyond. So uh, um, no, um, the 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 public in Germany is not. Um, not on the early adopter side of things. 
<laughs> well, listen, when it comes to infrastructure, we're no better off here because 25 is, is, is good for a lot of people. <coughs> 100 megabit would be fantastic for a lot of people. And we're nowhere near uh, gigabit here either. And I got one more. <coughs> I apologize. <clears throat> um, we just got uh, free Wi-Fi and all of our buses here in New York City. And uh, that might be great, but it doesn't make the buses go any faster. So a lot of us have been like, well, I wish you had uh, spent money on more buses or bus lanes or things like that. So uh, I, I don't know that if you guys ever get that free Wi-Fi on the buses, it'll be worth it. Well, we already have free Wi-Fi on most of the uh, high-speed trains. Mm. Um, well, I just took an Amtrak, and, and that Wi-Fi was terrible. So I don't know. We're, we're inverse. Yeah. <laughs> but well, we're also, we're also discussing about uh, free rides on public transportation currently mm. to uh, to uh, remove all the, uh, the, the, the the traffic congestions and uh, to to free up our uh, our our cities again, yeah, and uh, yeah. part of clean air and everything. Yeah. Mm. Well, right. That's what I'm saying. Is is we want the trains and the buses to run here in New York, and they instead gave us uh, free Wi-Fi on the buses. So. Um, Thomas Ganter, I'm going to let you go. Um, thank you so much for uh, being willing to uh, contribute all that for us. And um, thanks for uh, giving us yet another uh, different perspective on, on how the Internet and the web uh, sort of infiltrated all of our lives. Well, happy to have been part of this experience. I'm a big fan of the show. Oh, thank you so much. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast... Please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at NetHistoryPod, and my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.